uh, underrated perhaps in the media, but not by the people who have visited here. Uh, the people who have visited here, the comment tends to be, it's not awesome or overpowering, but for just sheer beauty, it just sweeps you away. There's people who have come from all over the world and there'll be different parts of the park that they'll just say are the most beautiful place that they've ever seen. Protection of the environment is a priority in most Canadian parks, and despite the highway running around the edge of it, this park is no exception. Heather Davis knew before she was out of her teens that she wanted to spend her life in the park service. As a naturalist, she has no doubt about the need to educate park visitors. I know a lot of people visualize national parks as recreational areas. And a lot of people do not understand that, you know, the main purpose of the park is to protect a certain portion of Canada for future generations. And, um, and then, and sort of the recreational aspect is secondary. It's a really difficult task. It's not easy. And um, we, uh, we're always struggling with that, uh, that issue within national parks. Like other balsam fir forests in the Maritimes, this one in Cape Breton Highlands National Park is afflicted by the spruce budworm. It is not a pretty sight, but naturalists now understand that like fire, the spruce budworm is part of the regeneration process. Spruce budworm does uh, go through a 75 year cycle. And uh, we knew that there was a cycle early in the century. I guess when the infestation occurred in the late 70s, early 80s, um, we may not have been expecting it, but uh, through historical records at the time, we realized that it was a natural occurrence and that it would, uh, and that we would just let it run its course through the park. When spruce budworm strikes, a dense, mature balsam fir forest goes right back to the beginning. White birch are among the first new trees to emerge from the devastation. And once they have established a canopy, the firs begin a comeback. But as James Bridgeland explains, the moose are very fond of white birch. Moose was one of, one of the species that was driven to extinction shortly after the Europeans arrived. By the end of the 1800s, Northern Cape Breton was missing moose, it was missing caribou, and it was missing timber wolves, all of which had been native here before. In the mid-1940s, moose were reintroduced to the park. The moose population prospered and multiplied during the 50s and 60s. But in the spruce budworm epidemic of the 70s, the balsam firs were wiped out, white birch became the predominant new growth, and the moose population exploded. The birches were promptly besieged by the moose, and once again, the delicate balance of an ecosystem was in danger. So one of our considerations is, is the moose going to affect this birch fir succession? Is it going to delay it? Is it, is it going to force it into another direction? See, the moose, are, while they were native here, when they were reintroduced, the major predator, the wolf, was not introduced as, as well. So we don't know whether or not the, the population levels that we're seeing at the moment of the moose are, are what you might expect in a natural system. Now that the hand of man has touched every segment, even of our wilderness areas, let alone a long settled and well populated region like Cape Breton, is a natural ecosystem still possible? That's something that James Bridgeland has done a lot of thinking about. The park may be fairly close to the landscape, or at least in the interior of the park, we may be approximating a landscape that, that predated the arrival of Europeans in northern Cape Breton. We have a landscape there that is relatively undisturbed if you compare it with other areas of the larger ecosystem that the, that the park tries to preserve. 
The waves on the beach seem timeless somehow, but they are not the same waves that lapped these shores before industrial pollution. And naturalists do not pretend that what is being preserved in the park is true wilderness. It can't be. It's what James Bridgeland calls a hybrid ecosystem that reflects the biological and cultural realities of this part of eastern Canada, an area that has been colonized by Europeans for 500 years. Once again, we appreciate the value of having spaces where we can observe how the landscape lives and breathes with only minimal human influence. And yet, as development nudges the edges of the park, this island within an island is affected. The dance steps, the stiff way the body is held, and much of the music have been passed down from generation to generation. Basically, the way of life here was, was pretty rugged, you know, it was fishing, and, and they used music, I think, as a way of, uh, of coping and a way of, of getting together. And you know, That's why it's so lively, because it was meant to be for good times, you know, get-togethers and stuff like that. There have been good times and bad times for the Acadian people. Their expulsion in 1775, after they refused to swear loyalty to the British crown, has been called one of the blackest moments in Canadian history. And their songs recall the pain they felt when they were uprooted and shipped away. We've been surrounded by mostly Scottish people for ever since we, the, the 1820s or thereabouts. And uh, the two cultures have, uh, have had their feuds, but mostly good agreement. I think mostly because we were coexisting, but yet living independently of each other. There were not that many contacts between the two groups. Charlie Dan Roach, an Acadian historian, often walks out on the old fishing pier at Cap Rouge. It's all that remains of one of several Acadian fishing villages that were evacuated when the National Park was created in 1936. Charlie Dan calls it the second expulsion. When the idea came forth to have a Cape Nineless National Park, these people who were settled there apparently posed a problem. For some reason or other, uh, Parks Canada at the time did not see well to have a park with people living in it. They said they had lots of room for animals, but no people. <laughs> So they had the, the rather cruel idea of expropriating the land. So it was kind of a second deportation for these people. And uh, there were some 30 some families that were again kicked off their lands. Um, this time it wasn't uh, quite as brutal. They were offered some money, some compensation, but not great amounts, I don't think. Um, and uh, it was certainly a heart tearing experience for some of them. My father was brought up in, in the National Park. My grandmother was brought up there. You know, like it was their, their, their home, and it was their roots. And they felt very much uprooted by, by it all. And some of them were bitter over the years. They came into a community that really wasn't theirs. They were like strangers that came into a bigger community, and they didn't, some of them could never fit in. 70 kilometers from Shattercamp, on the other side of the park, is Cape North. 20,000 displaced Scottish Highlanders, some victims of the clearances, some driven off the land by high rents or crop failures, came here late in the 18th century. The North Highlands Community Museum preserves their artifacts. To my mind, the museum is, is one of the most important things you can have because it's not the things in it really, it's, it's the pride that, that it develops not only, you know, with like adults, but also with the children. It gives them a, a good feeling about their uh, roots and their background, I think. The past is also your future, you know, because if you look in the past and you build from the past, you can look to the future and uh, it, it gives you a lot of stability, I think, to have the past behind you and to move forward. 